Good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen, and those who don't believe in gender. Welcome to Berkeley, California, and the Disruptors panel. I feel, I feel very much at home in this midst, uh, and we're gonna jump right in. I'm gonna ask each of the folks on the panel, um, first, your, gen or your pronoun of choice, or your pronoun of preference, so I don't mess it up as we go forward. Um, and then this bevy of questions, you can answer any or all of them as you, as you go. So for whom do you write? How often do you write? Favorite outlawed words, thoughts, or ideas? And uh, the name of your choice. Let's start on the end. Oh, well, man, I wish I could claim to be a queen so I could have plural. <laughs> we are not amused. <laughs> but I'll, t I'll stick with she and all that stuff. And um, I write for Harper's and The Guardian and Lit Hub and um, UC Press and Viking. And um, let me see. And for whom do you write? That How often do you write? As often as possible. Uh, and I, I get up to, I occasionally have multiple things come out in a day. Yeah. So uh, more if I don't do things like this. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Favorite and, outlawed word, thought, or idea? And I feel like in presidential election season, it's like we've outlawed the idea of popular power and grassroots power and power from below. And I just find that so much more exciting than yeah. leaders. <laughs> and, Is that uh, outlaw enough? No, it's perfect. And uh, the name of your choice, or how, how would you like to be called and or a name that provides us more insight into your life? Uh, just call me Rebecca. All right, Rebecca Solnit, ladies and gentlemen. And queens, and queens. Aya. Um, so my name, Aya de Leon. Uh, for whom do I write? I think for the most part I write for women. Um, and I think my, in some ways that connects to the, my favorite outlawed thought that that could be enough. Um, and how often do I write? I'm writing all the time. Uh, as a mom, I'm like, I remember like writing on my phone while nursing, waking up in the middle of the night with my daughter kind of half asleep plastered on me with the phone, like writing. <laughs> I edited my book on my phone in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, yeah, and my pronoun of choice is she, her. Oh, nice. All right. Okay. Given names or the name of your choice. Okay. So I'm Julia Serrano. Uh, she, her, hers. Um, so let's see, what were the, the things? So for who whom do you write? Yeah. I, um, so I'm not sure if that means like, I, is that supposed to be outlets or is that supposed to be audience? Sure. What? <laughs> yes, okay. I took it one way, she took it okay. the other way. Now I'm gonna I'm, do gonna, it the other way. <laughs> I'm gonna do both. I'm gonna have it both ways. Um, so basically I ha have uh, two books mm -hmm. that have been out on Seal Press um, and I sometimes write for other things, other news media outlets very occasionally, but not for any one particular one. Um, and uh, as far as like audiences I've been writing for, most of my writing has been at the intersection of feminism, queer and transgender activism. Um, and I've since been kind of panning back more talking about um, activist movements um, and issues about activist language and all that. Uh, so basically, people were interested in that. That's who I've mostly been writing for. And let's see, how often do I write? Um, uh, these days, uh, because of the fact that uh, I no longer have a full-time job, I'm pretty much writing every day. Um, when I did have a full-time job, that wasn't necessarily the case. It was kind of whenever I could fit time in. And um, as far as, I don't, I, <laughs> I'm having a hard time thinking of like, like outlaw words or ideas, but I'm very interested in something that I feel is completely missing from a lot of discussions about like social justice and activism, et cetera, is um, like unconscious, like things we, that are going through our mind unconsciously, the filters that we have that like are basically letting certain thoughts through and not other thoughts. And uh, I'm very interested in discussions about illuminating all that. So. Very nice. Thanks. I'm Chinaka, you can call me Nock. Um, favorite outlaw words, their thoughts or ideas, blackness. Um, given name of my choice, spoken already. For whom do I write? All of you. Thank you for being here today. 
Oh, and spirit fingers, I like that, very <laughs> nice. Um, so uh, let's talk about what you're working on now. Um, what are you writing and how is it disruptive? <laughs> Starting here again? Uh, you, I, uh, let's start with Aya. Okay. Um, get close to this mic. Um, so I, uh, for many years here in the Bay Area, was a spoken word and hip hop theater artist and uh, did a lot of social commentary through that. And then over the past few years have sort of developed an online journalism commentary blogger life, um, writing a lot of nonfiction. Uh, but finally, many years in the making, uh, my book is coming out. And so that's the kind of my biggest disruption project that I want to talk about. Um, Uptown Thief, it's coming out next month. Um, and so there are a number of disruptions within the book that are the content, and then there's also the things that I'm hoping to disrupt with the book. So um, it's a heist novel, it's sort of a Robin Hood story, basically a Puerto Rican woman protagonist running a women's health clinic on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and when the economy starts tanking, she returns to a life of crime to keep her nonprofit open. Um, she starts out... <laughs> Uh, with an escort service on the side because the clinic primarily serves sex workers. She's a former sex worker. And then when that's not enough, she begins um, robbing a group of corporate, corrupt corporate CEOs involved in a sex trafficking scandal. And then when that's still not quite enough money because it takes a lot to keep a nonprofit running in New York, they uh, end up heisting a billionaire. Um, and so I, I, um, this morning uh, at Rebecca Solnit's conversation, you were talking about... Uh, income inequality within cities, right? And so part of the disruption is that she's disrupting the income inequality by stealing it back. Um, and I think about that as just a, just sort of a vision of really extreme activism. And you know, don't try this at home necessarily, but I, I just, I like the idea of the income inequality as something that we can create fantasy stories where people disrupt it really directly. Um, and you know, she, she steals the money and gets away with it and brings it to the community. I think also in terms of thematically, uh, I think about sex workers and it really disrupts, I think I chose to write about sex work because sex work exists at this intersection of gender, class, race, commerce, nationality, and um, it really disrupts the narratives of who sex workers are, right? And it's this binary that sex workers are either immoral women who need to be punished or victims who need to be rescued. So it really disrupts that by making this sex worker protagonist the moral compass of the story and the rescuer of women who are being exploited. And it disrupts that binary also within the feminist movement that either sex work is empowering or it's oppressive. And there's a spectrum in the world and in the book from people who are trafficked to someone who's a worker, you know, with decent labor conditions and good pay that allows them to live some kind of life under capitalism where they feel like they have some integrity. Um, and I think that the final disruption for me that I'm hoping for or aspiring to with the book is to sort of disrupt with the audience of the novel a sort of a binary of women readers, the literary versus romance slash chick lit. Like this is a novel that in my wildest dreams would be really widely read and kind of create a, create a common language. Like you know how some cities would be like, we're all reading this one book. You know, I, I just, it's full of all these subversive themes, but it's also like a steamy beach read, you know? So I'm hoping that this novel could just be something that would really connect uh, women's conversations and really sort of disrupt and shake up the ways that women are categorized and separated. Great. Julia, same question. Um, what are you making? How is it disruptive? Okay, so I would say that kind of in the last year, my writing focus has been on two different areas that are, are different but disruptive um, at the same time. Um, a lot of what I've been doing the last year is um, I've, I've been a longtime trans activist and talking about um, the intersection of transgender activism and feminism. Um, and my book, my first book, Weapon Girl, A Transsexual Woman on Sexism and the Scapegoating of Femininity, um, the second edition just came out. Um, and so I was able to, in addition, write a preface looking back on the activism I've done over 15 years and how it's changed, especially now that there's a lot of trans visibility in the media, which is totally not the case 15 years ago. Um, 
kind of looking at that work, and then also I'm putting together a self-published book um, that will be out later in the year called Outspoken that's a collection of trans theme pieces from all those years. And in kind of that body of work, looking at it, just not only ways in which um, as a trans activist, as a transgender person, kind of disrupting people's normative ideas of how gender or sexuality should work. Um, but also in the course of a lot of that writing and activism, I had to confront basically um, exclusionary forces within other um, other activist movements, whether it's um, certain strands of feminism or um, gay liberation have had very anti-transgender biases over the years, and that's been evolving and changing for the better, thankfully, but um, so kind of engaging not only, you know, disrupting kind of mainstream notions, but also kind of within um, left progressive forces that also maybe have um, exclusionary ideas about you. So that's kind of a lot of what I've been doing. And then the newest project is I've been working on fiction lately um, under the, it's, I'm doing it under pen name to, to kind of keep some separation between that and my nonfiction under the pen name Cat Cataclysm, which is kind of like her, her punk rock name. And, uh, and in that, and that kind of evolved, at first I just started writing, um, and as that voice has kind of developed and come together, a lot of that character, what they're talking about is um, bisexuality, which is another aspect of myself that has come up a bit in my nonfiction, but not so much. And I feel that, especially in a world where people feel like the average person is like, oh, I'm totally cool with gay and lesbian people, and yes, yeah, sort of trans people, and like bisexual or pansexual people are kind of like lost in the conversation. Um, and also, the character happens to be ethically non-monogamous, and especially living in the Bay Area where there is, there are a lot of people I know who are in ethically non-monogamous relationships, um, who maybe are, are kinky or are, you know, pansexual, et cetera. Um, there's kind of a lot going on there beyond just the surface of like gay and trans. <laughs> and even though we have made a lot of progress in the mainstream with some acceptance of those identities. There are all these other um, sexual minorities who are, are totally overlooked. You know, I was talking about sex workers. Like, that's still really taboo to talk about. And so wanting to have, and, and, and cat cataclysm, that's kind of, it's humorous and surreal. And so kind of giving myself in a, a different way rather than just kind of activist manifestos, which is a lot of what I've written in the past, um, just to kind of challenge people's notions about what's normative or not with regards to sexuality. So, thank you. Oh, me. Oh, there's so many. You know, it's been really nice to be doing a lot of kind of newspaper and magazine stuff lately because the world is changing so fast and things are erupting so rapidly. And... Um, you know, if I have time, and the three things I want to go home and write. It's funny, yesterday I thought that, uh, I thought yesterday was Sunday and today was going to be Monday and I was going to get up and write and then I realized like yesterday was Saturday and <laughs> so I didn't get up and write today. And, um, you know, more about violence against women because like until it stops, um, there you need to remind people uh, that, you know, it's this epic, epidemic, horrific, destructive force that you know, under a lot of other circumstances would be considered a crisis or an emergency or a war or an outrage, but it just sort of like slips on quietly, tolerated, encouraged, etc. So a piece about, um, I was talking about this morning about president, why presidential elections are like disaster movies <laughs> and, um, and that they kind of lock us into the same myth of the, the, lead, the heroic leader figure who will save us, which I find really just sad and draining because it, people sort of forget how much power we have and how much we change things and so I'm thinking about writing about that and also looking at a lot of stuff like I don't know how many of you follow I know San Francisco is really far away from here um, but I'm, I'm from there I'm like the ambassador from the other side of the bay over here <laughs> and um, okay I know there welcome, are welcome. I know I'm not alone what? welcome thank, <laughs> thank you it's amazing. We speak almost the same language. Namaste. But no, it was, I, one of the remarkable things was that, and some of you probably follow the Frisco Five hunger strike that the police chief of San Francisco, thank you, you know, they forced, and, and it was kind of a fascinating thing because, because people can't quantify that kind of popular power. Um, 
I just visited a friend of mine who coined a phrase I use all the time, the tyranny of the quantifiable. Mm. It's hard to quantify the kinds of power civil society, ordinary people gathered together have, but they forced the police chief of San Francisco to resign. Like within a few days of all these politicians in the San Francisco Chronicle saying that there was no reason for it to happen, it wasn't going to happen. And, uh, and there's been a lot of other stuff like that that I find so much more encouraging than the idea that we'll give all our power to a special magic superhuman person who will make everything beautiful while we sit on our hands. I'm not actually a big fan of that narrative, which you hear versions of all over presidential elections. So I'm thinking about those, and at some point I appointed myself Google's hater in chief. <laughs> um, you know, I know we have some poetry slam champions here. Like, I don't know if we have like like tech haters uh, competitions, but you know, I think, feel like I could throw down for that. And um, it's been really interesting. There was a story that came out a few days ago about how Uber has created this whole new billion-dollar financed business to get poor people to buy cars on credit that they can't afford so they can drive for Uber because Uber can't keep drivers employed, and this is a way to tra trap people in what I call the sharecropping economy. Yeah. It's a subprime loan, but they actually stole yeah. the business model from somewhere else. It's like even more deplorable than you think. They stole it from Breeze, which was a functioning company all its own, and Uber acquired them to, to, oh, really? to, to oh, steal their subprime business it. lending model. It's you know, craziness. So I've been looking at that about the way Airbnb, and I just was in rural uh, Marin County on the west side where there aren't very many people, so like every community ma member matters. And they just feel like they're being destroyed by Airbnb because if you have all these transients passing through, you lose a house that might have housed somebody who's going to participate in the, you know, in community planning and community support, community activities. And then I was in Torrey, Utah, for my partner's mother's 95th birthday, and uh, they actually banned Airbnb because they're like, if you, they didn't ban it. They just said if you want to run a hotel, you need to have a you know, an employee on the premises at all times and a license, and that kind of took care of that. But it's been interesting. I've been hearing from Venice to San Francisco's Chinatown to New Orleans how much Airbnb is destroyed. And it's one of those things, and it's like, it's funny being on a panel called Disruptors, because that's one of the words Silicon Valley likes to masturbate in the mirror to. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I just, you just look at it and you have to say, like, well, what are you disrupting? I and mean, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of senior citizens being kicked out of their homes in ways that turn out to be fatal. And you know, it's like we need to talk about like what, what kinds of disruption we're, we're for and what kinds we're not so much. But I think it's interesting the way Silicon Valley has become such a powerfully destructive cultural or anti-cultural and uh, economic force and part of the economic divide. And how, because it happens piecemeal, because they, have their, because they are the propaganda machine in a lot of ways, et cetera, that it doesn't really get put together. So I'm thinking about doing, you know, Soon, you know, when I have a moment, um, trying trying to get back on the Silicon Valley beat because there's so not nearly enough criticism where it will be about some specific thing, the latest CEO to be caught beating a woman or something like that, and um, but we don't really look at the pattern like what have these people brought us over the last five years, ten years, twenty years, and what has it done to our attention spans or our. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of our housing stock, our transportation systems, you know, I could go on for hours, but I'll write an essay instead later. Cool. Uh, I hate panels, so I think we're just going to have a conversation for, from here on oh, yeah. out. And I'm piqued by, but I'm troubled, conflicted often with this, this idea of technologists. I'm the child of black technologists who moved here yeah. in the 1980s. Um, and the wave of folks who came in displaced them from their work just as much as we were displaced from our homes or our neighborhoods as well. And so my mother, I, who's the, just the fucking best, she's the fucking best, she's the most disruptive person I've ever met, um, finds so much issue feeling like Oakland is no longer hers. She was a transplant that moved here respectfully in the 80s, built a black school, taught technology to black kids, can't work in, in her industry right now, and feels very much, if I, if I can assume how she feels, feels very much separated um, from conversation when all people who are involved in tech are instantly the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And so she feels in many ways displaced from political struggle, which she was always central to, and displaced from economic struggle because of where the industry is and lost her job last week. So in a very real way is like 57-year-old technologist, black woman who can't find work in the heart of 
Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So I, I just bring that to the table to complicate what disrupting means and who, like who really the enemy is and who really um, takes the brunt um, of these displacements. You know what I mean? You know, I don't think that there's the technologies. I often think what, what if search engines and social media had been founded as public commons controlled for the public good rather mm -hmm. than advertising driven harvesters of your personal data to enrich um, incredibly rich young white men mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, and the, the tools can be used in a lot of different ways. And I, you know, this morning, I, you just talked to Mona, who's used yeah. Twitter as sort of for feminist liberation and as part of the Arab Spring, they can do a lot of, you know, I use some of them, they can do a lot of different things, but the people the people who are in charge of them and the ways that they use them for social engineering, like the Uber example mm -hmm. we just went into, you know, like, you know, a new way for people to hail taxis, that's awesome, well, let's underpay the drivers and drive them, you know, and not screen the people we hire and uh, outsource all the, you know, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of ways that these things could happen and they happen in ways that maximize profit off sort of, you know, and that are basically sharecropping models right. often and that's got kind of stuff and the cultural disruption, mm -hmm. to use the word in a negative way, that comes with them, for example, with the Airbnb model all over the world, which is being protested in a lot of those places. So it's one of those things where... Technology is a lot of different things, mm -hmm. and you know, I know we're not going to go in a magic time machine and make it 1980 dial up. Yeah, um, you know, I don't you think know, any land, of us would like that. <laughs> again, so like, we don't even need to discuss whether or not those things yeah. should exist. But, but who benefits from how they exist, and who mm -hmm. who determines, and what ways there are to work against, around, and you know, and. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm interested with technology. Absolutely. But, I think it really well, aptly begs ask, the question. What, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, why hasn't your mother chosen to be a young white man? <laughs> she thought about it for a long time, but then Eminem was already rapping, and she was like... <laughs> Plus she looks like Storm. Like in the real... Like it's like me, but with silver hair and like a little curvier. My mom was like, she looks like the real life superhero deal. Um, my question for you, and I guess from what was my question for Mona that I didn't get to ask earlier, is in a very concrete way, using uh, or paraphrasing Audre Lorde, can we use the master's tool to dismantle the house? And if so, how can we use technology or literature or uh, erotic-driven non-profit sexy novels <laughs> <laughs> to dismantle the master's house? And it's an interesting thing. When are when, who decides that they they're the master's mm. tools? Because it also feels like the the kind of detournement we haven't seen is somebody saying like, you know, these are our tools mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, and it, you can take and it's such a powerful statement. I've used it talking about violence at times when it's you know, but you know, whose tools are they and which tools and like why do we let them think? You know, why why would we give up things that maybe we can own? And maybe, you know, in you know, in Mona's hands the tools are are feminist insurrectionist democratizing tools. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. Master's tools. Well, the thought that I have is just um first of all that what it is we're trying to disrupt and ultimately dismantle is a very, very long term project. Right, and it's going to need a lot of tools. And so I, I've I've always loved that Audre Lorde quote. And you know, there's there's a lot there, and there's a there are a lot of layers of it. I know one of the things um, one of the things that's been critical to me about this notion of the master's tools has been looking at internalized oppression, right? And I wrote a piece a while back for the Vita website that basically ended up with like you know. We need to, if we want to dismantle the master's house, we need to stop knocking on the door of the master's MFA program. You know, it was talking about my own, uh, what was it called? Uh, my MFA career as a recovering prestige fiend, right? Mm -hmm. Where I, you know, wanted to go to the elite MFA and then like, why are they treating me so bad? It's like, yeah, because elitism is all tied into the classism and racism and sexism and homophobia and, you know, xenophobia and like, oh, funny thing, like, you know, the, the lefty brown girl had a bad experience. Um, and, and so I feel like that's part of it. It's like the internalized, what was that? Um, that uh, Claire V. Watkins, I had a working replica of the patriarchy in my head, mm -hmm. right? And so I feel like that's one of the critical things so that 
it's really like with those tools in my hand, what matters so much is what's in my head, what's my intention, you know, what kind of unconscious programming is running. Like you were talking about what's unconscious, right? What unconscious programming is running that I may not even be aware of. And, and then, you know, to the degree that it's a really, really long-term project, I think partly for me when I think about this book that I've written and, you know, one of the things that's really exciting when my agent went out with it, we were like, we have no idea if this book will sell and if so, where it's going to land, right? And we had interest from big five houses because it's got sort of commercial appeal and, you know, um, you know it's well written and we also got some interest from like really quirky, lefty, indie presses, and it eventually landed at Kensington Dafina, which for anyone who's not familiar, um, publishes books called things like Baby Mama Drama, you know? And so it was like, okay, this is interesting. It really landed in a sort of a street lit uh, imprint, which is not known for its radical feminism or wealth redistribution. Um, <laughs> But is it, though? Let's talk about that. We'll, well put a yes, pin in Zane. Yes, we'll come back we to will, that. We because, will, yes. because, part of what, because part of the reason it could land there is that these women are trying to get money, right? right? And that's very much a part of the conversation, although they're not necessarily like, get money, use it for feminist health care. Like, the second part is new to, to that immigrant. Um, so I think, but I'm excited because I feel, I, I believe that within the literary industry, Typically, you know, people of color get swept up in these notoriously white imprints who then basically know how to sell books to white people and don't know how to sell books to their community. So I'm excited that I'm in an imprint that is selling books to, you know, young, younger, low-income black and Latina women. And I'm excited. I feel like part of what needs to get disrupted is the classism, right, about what are the conversations that people are supposed to be having, and then the society reinforces, like, okay, you people are supposed to be talking about this, and we will mine your information on technology and aggressively sell you the same conversation that you may be having that we think you're supposed to be having. So I feel like that, I think that that's one of the things that's really important in terms of the tools is how can people have access to political information in the place that is home for them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Something that I uh, was thinking about all of this, I find as someone who, as a trans activist, 15 years ago, never in a million years did anybody in the mainstream ever let me get in front of a microphone and take that girl in my mouth. were these really, you know, they were set up. They were the talk show thing, they were the documentary, and it was all designed to like, this is what we're going to do with the trans person. You know, we're going to do the before and after pictures, and we're going to talk about their genitals after surgery, and we're going, you know, it's just this whole thing. And like, you couldn't even talk about like, trans people being marginalized. And uh, kind of funny in thinking about technology, because uh, having a lot of the, um, really ambivalent feelings about it that a lot of us do, the ways in which technology can be used for activism at the same time that technology is, you know, especially locally, um, driving away a lot of people who are activists and can't afford to live someplace that's getting as expensive as it is, right? Um, but uh, anyway, the, the trans community, a lot of what helped the trans community coalesce was the internet because we are such a relatively small fraction of the population. When you're 3% of the population, it's really hard as people to come together to find each other. And basically, that kind of allowed that to happen and allowed a lot of trans activism to happen. And, um, and so now thinking about it, where I am now, especially with everything that's happened in the last like year or two um, with celebrity trans people and such, um, I've, for the first time in my life, had mainstream uh, media outlets contact me and wanting me to write something about something that's happened. Um, and like the idea that I would write for like time is weird. <laughs> and the thing that I find struggling with that all the time now is that, you know, what they want is they want a 1,000 word, a 1,000 word 
you know, piece written by a transgender person about this transgender issue. And the fact that they know, they even think about inviting a trans person to talk about a trans issue is progress. But at the same time, it's a thousand words to a mainstream audience, right? Um, and like, God forbid, you know, like it, it would take, you know, 20 of those words to define the word cisgender, right? <laughs> you know, like, I, and, and just a lot of the ideas as an activist that, that I have, you can't really do much. And if you read a lot of these articles, and they're very well intentioned and everything, but a lot of times it's like, you know, there's this bathroom law, and then trans people are oppressed, and then statistics, 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 and then we shouldn't have these laws, right? And what I have been trying to do, and have done in a couple <coughs> cases, is I don't want to write that piece because everyone's writing that piece. And I think that telling people those statistics are important, um, but I, I think that there are also things that we can do to maybe make people think in a different way about issues, like to try to just be a little bit subversive, get some ideas in their head that are kind of outside of the formula of, oh, trans people are oppressed, we shouldn't oppress trans people. Like, because the, the root of, of, you know, not just trans people, but for a lot of gender and sexual minorities, and if you're talking about any kind of form of marginalization, it's all institutionalized. It's all these things that seem like common sense to the average person, but you know is, is the thing, you know, you know, gender is just common sense, and that idea is what marginalizes trans people more so than, you know, just there are mean people out there who are transphobic. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of something I find myself struggling with and, and using kind of tools that are very mainstream, tools that are used to propagate kind of common sense and trying to use them to support it. That line of thinking, how has sort of a dominant narrative, particularly with celebrity trans people, affected your ability to tell your authentic story? Does that make sense as a question? Well, she had gotten in the way of, of our stories because Caitlyn Jenner's famous. Yeah, um, I think that, I think that the Caitlyn Jenner story fit already within the narratives, and, and, and there's been a lot of talk amongst you know, trans activists um, that I've had conversations with about that narrative is already there, and a lot of the people who are the celebrity trans people fit that narrative pretty well. Um, you know, there aren't any non-binary identified famous trans people, for example. Um, on the other hand, I would say that the increase in, in visibility that's come, especially with Caitlyn Jenner's coming out, has allowed the ability for other voices to get out there. Um, and, and the one thing that comes to my mind is on the I Am Kate, her, her reality show in the second year, and, and both episodes, both seasons had, and I, I, I only watched one episode, so I can't really talk about it. Mine, you know you watch it all. <laughs> I don't even have to like But, uh, but the, in the, each of them had multiple different trans people. Like it's, I think it's kind of like a, a, a road thing where like Caitlyn Jenner and a bunch of trans women go on the road together. And like I know in the last year they had Kate Bornstein, who's one of the people on it, who if you don't know who she is, she's um, like one of the kind of trans activism pioneers. She wrote an amazing book, Gender Outlaw, that came out in the 90s, it was really influential. And she's not binary identified. And so, well, I think that the Caitlyn Jenner you know, Caitlyn Jenner kind of narrative plays into the really the dominant narrative that a lot of trans people find um, conflicts with their own experiences. It has created some space so that some people have had different experiences are are getting to to talk more. So. Okay. Question, ladies. Two questions. How do we fuck up Trump? That's question number one. How do we stop? That's my whole question. How do we? Uh, how do? How do we? How do we stop Trump? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! There's like. I mean, I can ask like a bunch of like theoretical questions, but since we're disruptors, I figure why not? You know what I mean? Like, is there something? Oh, there's so many things. It's, it feels like nobody's really tried yet. There was an interview just this week where somebody actually made him answer the question about his racism against the judge who's got a Latino, a Spanish last name, but is not Mexican. You know, and Trump wanted to talk about building his wall and them and all this stuff. And the guy, 
you know, apparently asked him like 25 times to nail him down. The media has been giving, has been on this kind of like, oh, he's fun, we get clicks, let's run with it. And they're now beginning to feel a little bit like, oh my God, we're in bed with Satan, what are we doing? You know, this is sort of like Rosemary's Baby, what, do, what are we doing here? And it feels like there's a lot of ways that actually do like be, you know, who needs to be consistent. I think social media campaigns and things like that that could really emphasize lies, racism, marital rape, exploitation with his for-profits uh, university, uh, mafia connections, um, more lies, and his, li his lies rating is incredible. The other thing is, I, I, I don't know, and I don't, I, haven't, I don't watch TV hardly at all, so like the way that he became, I, I, I sort of don't get how people take this like rumpled orange bag that keeps crumpling and exploding and squinching and twitching, you know, that's his face seriously. He's really kind of one of the most freakish looking people on earth and there's all these caricatures of him, you know, and his orangeness and his squinchiness and, you know, and his bizarre facial expressions and his like, you know, and his tiny flappy hands, you know, which makes him look like somebody, there was, when after Katrina, George Bush pretended to hold a hammer and you could tell he'd never held one before. <laughs> and uh, Donald Trump looks like somebody who's never actually done anything, you know, the, the, the kind of haplessness of him. And the, the idea that this is masculinity, you know, it's like really truck drivers buy that, this mm. person who, you know, this, this histrionic, flappy person, I don't know, it's, you know, not that I'm like, you know, I would, I, I, don't, I sort of don't get it, but I think it's actually, of people, I think there's a lot of ways to just bring up, not sort of like what he looks like, or, you know, his gestures and things, which are kind of bizarre in themselves, but really to just, you know, the incredible corruption, dishonesty, privilege and destruction in his history and you know and it's interesting like how does that stuff how and it's one of the ideas I'm interested in how do ideas go from margins to the center watching the idea that we needed to get rid of the police chief of San Francisco and that the police department was out of control you know kind of how do ideas move like that I think it's really possible to do with Trump and um, but and, and, and I don't know what it you know, would it be social media campaigns organized by people? But, you know, we better start really soon. I don't know. What are other people's ideas? It'd I be guess interesting to hear a refining of the too. question is what can a writer do? Yeah. Since that's what the... Well, one... Yeah. We are writers. Yeah. Um, well, one thought that I have that I think that's really, really important um, has to do with figuring out how to, in a principled way interrupt some of the misogyny that's directed at Hillary without becoming a Hillary apologist, mm -hmm. right? Um, because the, because there are- You have permission to clap whenever you want to clap. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I have said for, for years, my, my family, uh, my mom was the first Latina on the Berkeley Board of Education. So I was like in electoral politics, falling asleep at meetings at the age of like six or seven. Um, and so I grew up learning you vote. Voting is like going to the bathroom. It may not be pleasant, but you have to do it. Um, and so, and you know, from a lefty family too, like my, my first disruption was in the anti-nuclear movement as a teenager. So like we blockaded, I organized other teens to like blockade. Um, so, but it wasn't, we didn't believe electoral politics was gonna save us. Like you said, oh, the hero will come, the disaster movie. But um, you had to do it. And I think over time, I've, you know, people say, oh, there are no differences between the Democrats and Republicans. And you know what? Sometimes it's looking bad. But at the end of the day, when I worked in social services, I was a harm reductionist. And I believe that the Democrats are harm reduction. You know, the Democrats aren't gonna save and free us. But here's the difference. The Republicans will do everything to use the power of the state to crush our resistance movements and do all kinds of shady shit that we'll be having to scamper around responding to, whereas the Democrats will sort of support business as usual, including our ability to organize. Um, and, you know, not that everything's so great, and really we're seeing folks are revealing, you know, between NAFTA and the growth of the prison industrial complex under Clinton, like there's some really, really shady, shady 
debatey stuff. But the difference is about our ability to organize. And I think for me, that basic message um, is profound in that in the past, there were Democrats who were just as shady as Hillary and the level of response and scrutiny was not the same. So there's something happening here with sexism and misogyny that we need to figure out how to intervene in without being utterly defensive and acting as if she can do no harm because people can see that. And so I, I think that that's really important, but it's also important to the best of our ability to kind of stay calm because I feel <laughs> like part of the stuff with Trump is, you know, he's figuring out how to get a rise out of everybody, how to get the rise out of the media, but also how to get a rise out of those of us who can, you know, panic and have nightmares just imagining five minutes of a Trump presidency. And so, I, you know, those are some thoughts that I have around disruption, that it's important to disrupt that, um, it's really important to disrupt that misogyny. And I think it's also becoming important to disrupt some of the, um, some of the one hit wonderness of Bernie's income inequality platform that um, that's very, very important. And it's not integrated into Hillary's identity or platform in the same way, but it's not, it hasn't been enough work to build the movement that he's talking about. And so I think we need to elect a Democrat and go on about building our movement. Yeah, um, I, and agreeing with a lot of what's been said on, to on top of that, I, I mean, I think that the way, the best way to get at Trump, whether it's writers or kind of like, you know, politi politicians and the media and all that, is just the truth, right? <laughs> um, Hillary Clinton had that speech during the last week where she just kind of went through all the things Donald Trump actually said, and it was really, really powerful. And I think that, hopefully, I'd like to think that the one kind of, you know, Trump card, I guess. That, <laughs> no, but like the one card that I think the Democrats have is that the Republicans didn't go after Trump because they all wanted to like kind of, you know, ride his, his you know, What's that called when cyclists kind of hide behind each other, winding? Yeah, the, or, the windstream slipstream. Yeah, tailwind. Tailwind. Yeah. Sciences. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, all the Democrats, all the Republicans were trying to stay in the race to the very end to be the ones who beat him up, and none of them succeeded. And so he hasn't been called out on like a ton of the stuff that he's done. And so I'd like to think that just the truth. Hey, you said this, and hopefully, if the media kind of if this is a real trend, that they're actually starting to hold him accountable for things he said, then maybe um, I think that that will reveal him for who he really is, and maybe a lot of the people who are kind of on the fence or independent will realize, oh my God. Um, the one thing I wanna say, though, on top of that is how we shouldn't go after Trump. Um, and just, I would say, in the last few weeks, I've noticed as it's become obvious that he's going to be the nominee and people really panicking about it and wanting to go after him, I've seen especially a lot of what I would describe as both misogynistic and ableist attacks on him. So one that I've seen a lot coming from like, you know, liberals on TV and everything talking about he's psychologically unfit, psychologically unbound. He has narcissistic disorder. Have you ever, ever read the, you know, the this? And you know, it's like, I think that we can prove by what he said that he's unfit to lead without kind of, you know, having like a lot of ableist language in there. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard a lot of people trying to flip the script on him, like basically his like hyper masculinity, which I don't understand why people see that in him. But so people are trying <laughs> to flip that's it. What it's I was like, trying to say is mm -hmm. I just don't get it. Yeah. But but on top of that, I've heard people trying to say, oh well, you know, he's so overly emotional and overreacts. And you know, I think like Bill Maher Bill Maher says lots of stuff. <laughs> this is just like, oh God. But um I think I think he has this meme where like, you know, Donald Trump is a whiny bitch, you know? Mm. And just watching how like the way like going after his masculinity by proving that he's not really masculine, aka using like kind of feminizing words to shame him. So I would like to think that we can kind of not engage in that kind of, uh, those kind of attacks. I don't think that they're necessary and I don't think they'll have as much power as just kind of the truth about who he is and what he said and what he's done. So.
I'm, I had a follow-up question, but I'm going to bypass it because you guys all answered embedded there. So the next question is maybe the most serious. Um, in an age where trans women are more likely to be killed than anyone else in the United States, in an age where black people's lives are not safe, in a time where most of us can't afford to live in San Francisco and are getting priced out of the Bay Area, how do we make words that matter? How do we make words make a difference? How do we as writers actually disrupt? I hang out with doctors a lot for some reason these days, and I always feel like even a diagnosis is the beginning, even if you don't have the cure. And just to describe accurately the intersections, for example, and I worked on uh, a big story about the, I attended the trial for the, the civil trial for the murder of Alex Nieto by the SFPD, and it was really interesting. I had never really realized before the way that if the police murder you, you have to be discredited the same way that a rape victim mm -hmm. has to be discredited. And I think that there's, you know, that, that in a, it's funny because there's a way that the left is always like, we need to start the revolution. And I always feel like, well, we're, we could do, we could probably do it better. We need more people on board, but you know, the revolution is underway. And part of it is just, you know, sometimes we have the cure, but even when you don't have the cure, diagnosing, things, you know, with clarity so that people know what's going on and can make choices around that, I think is really powerful. And I think just describing these situations, I've just been, I've seen the way Occupy Wall Street made income inequality a national issue, seeing the way Black Lives Matter made police violence a national issue, you know, these things that just make these things unavoidable, front and center, undeniable in the conversation have been really important, even if there's not always a like, and now here's how we get out of there. But I think everything you're talking about has violence as a common denominator and violence and inequality. And I think that having a kind of unified field theory to talk about the belief systems behind that, who benefits, and um, you know the ways that, that gender identity and masculinity in particular are constructed and used, um, the, you know, and things like that is part of the diagnosing, even when we don't say that, you know, I haven't figured out how to fix toxic masculinity yet, but I'm working on it. So, um, I guess I would say, you know, as a writer, part of what I'm trying to do is go into those places that are considered apolitical and politicize them, right? So that, um, you know, and I was on the romance panel earlier, and the the real the the one thing that the romance is supposed to have is this happily ever after ending. And there are many things that we can critique about that, and maybe in many reasons that we could or should. But really, other than that, all bets are kind of off, which for me is exciting in terms of creating a site of politicization. And I think um, one of the one of the reasons that I picked this sort of fictional world that I've created is that the world of sex work is this incredibly intersectional world, right? So you have, you know, for the most part, women who are um, coming up from a space of economic necessity, women of color, immigrant women, and trans women, you know? And it's this space where folks are figuring out how to negotiate male domination um, and from a place of, that really lacks pretense. So I, there was something really compelling for me about creating characters who are living lives where they can't really afford pretense. There isn't a lot of pretense. Um, and embedding in that kind of world, you know, fun and sexiness, but also all of these messages, I think, um, you know, Black Lives Matter messages, Trans Lives Matter messages, like really figuring out how to create characters that folks empathize with. Because I think, you know, we're in this massive crisis of empathy as a society and world. And so I think for me as a fiction writer, empathy is so key in terms of being able to care about people's lives. And, and fiction also is something that you have to sink into and spend a little bit of time there. So in a world of social media and 140 characters, I love my Twitter, but you know, it's great to have, you know, 100,000 words that you can sink into to really um, develop relationships with folks and, see, and you know, hopefully um, see something about the world differently. Yeah, I've, 
yeah, I would agree with that. The especially with fiction, the ability to like bring people into a world that is maybe not the world they're used to, and in a lot of ways, you know, thinking about it as you know, we're just in this world, and most people are aware that oppression happens. So for, in some cases, it's happening to them, and other forms are not happening to them, and they're less aware of that. Uh, but with fiction, you can just basically grab someone and bring them into the world, and like basically show them this is the water that you're swimming in, you know, or this is the water that a lot of us are swimming in. And then a lot of what I've been thinking about with regards to um, nonfiction that I've been thinking about and starting to work on is I feel like we're at a point where people get, like the average person, um, left-leaning or kind of like average person kind of gets the idea that, okay, discrimination happens to some people, that's bad. But I think people have a very, very one-on-one um, -on -one idea about it. They think that there are bad actors and bad actors are doing bad thing to people. And they're like, I'm against this person doing discriminatory act X against this person. Um, and wanting to get around the whole bad actor idea, because as long as it's bad actors versus good actors, everybody wants to think of themselves as a good actor, um, and you can't really tell what's going on. But trying to get beyond that idea of thinking about kind of discrimination and prejudice being something that some people have and other people are free of, and getting more towards illuminating to people both unconscious assumptions that we all hold and also basically institutionalized oppression, which I think is something that the average person does not really get. Um, I think that that's one of the things about you know the Black Lives Matter movement that has been really powerful is that it's like illuminated um, to people who um, kind of maybe hadn't seen that before, even though they should have, that look, there's this system. The system is messed up. Um, I think that that's what Occupy Wall Street was doing. I think that like, you know, there's the system. Like, I think the average person doesn't think about the system. The average person is, you know, they're, they're trying to like, how am I gonna pay for my health care? You know, um, I'm, I need to find a job. And uh, we all have to partake in these systems in order to survive in this world, but kind of making people aware of the fact that they are systems. And, and I think that there has been some, some progress uh, in that in recent years, I would say, but we definitely could use a lot more. So one more question from me, and then we're gonna open it up to the room for probably like three or four really solid questions. Um, so think about your really good solid question that has like a, like a question part of it. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, one of my favorite moments in literature is in Tony Cade Bambara's The Salt Eaters, where you see uh, women in a circle without others um, healing themselves. And for me, it's one of the few moments where I've seen equity at work in literature in a way that wasn't reactive, but was um, proactive. And so I wonder for you, who are the folks who've written something that made you feel like you saw equity in the text or freedom in the text or joy in the text? One example. Or you can choose to tell me your top five MCs that are left. <laughs> She's a game I and I've been playing for 15 years. Anyone can begin. Shanaka stumped the disruptors. <laughs> <laughs> well, get only one, like, you know. I mean, two. <laughs> stage one bargaining. <laughs> hmm. Stage one bargaining? Oh, that you're in stage. I thought you were saying that's the name of this, the text. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. That would not be a liberatory text. <laughs> I mean, for me, Subcomante Marcos and the Zapatistas had this kind of amazing reinvention of the language of, of politics from the kind of stale Marxist kind of Puritan language of we should and economics and et cetera to this kind of vibrant, poetic, visionary sense of embracing possibility, a little bit mystical, a little bit comic and just sort of wide open to possibilities and deeply inclusive, whether it's Marcos saying, and I'm gay in San Francisco, I'm the cleaning woman on the subway at 10 p.m., I'm, you know, I'm Palestinian in Israel, I'm, and stuff like that, but also just a real kind of joy in the language that, 
you know, this isn't something that we should do, be, you know, because so often revolution is described sort of like eating your spinach. It's like this is this is heady, delicious, amazing stuff. So, you know, I thought of Ursula K. Le Guin. I thought of a lot of Native American stuff I've been around, but I'll, st I'll, I'll give it to the Zapatistas. Mm -hmm. And beautiful, beautiful language. Thank you, Rebecca Solnit. Okay, so I is going to take more time. I, I could say something. Yeah. Yes. Um, in trying to think about it, um, basically during like the 1990s, um, trans activism, which looked very different than it looks now, um, I had mentioned Kate Bornstein. Um, uh, she is one of these people. There's Leslie Feinberg. There is uh, uh, Ricky Ann Wilchins. Um, and basically, kind of how trans activism was then, which was, it was very, very marginalized and there was not a lot of acceptance within like, you know, feminism and within like kind of gay lesbian communities. And the approach in a lot of their activist books, um, which I think would be really refreshing today, you know, now 20 years later, was they talked about gender, not just about, oh, we're transgender people and this is what we have to deal with, but they kind of use their gender um, identities and, and the fact that they kind of fell outside of kind of the, the lines of gender or colored outside of the lines of gender. And they use that to kind of tie together their experiences, the experiences of, you know, whether it's women who are feminists or whether it's other queer people or whether it's just kind of people in the straight mainstream just saying, look, all of us are kind of like put into these boxes and all of us sometimes are coloring outside the lines of these boxes. And not to say that, oh, we all like are facing the same thing or, you know, not like kind of, you know, oh, blind to gender type of thing. But, uh, but in order to say, to, to basically use the language of, you know, what I'm going through is related to what you're going through. And if we all agree that, that these boxes, these lines that we've set up are arbitrary and are hurting all of us, you know, that would help all of us. And I think that that's a very, um, that was very powerful to me when I was first kind of coming out as trans. And I think it's a message that um, we've gotten, we, we're in a different place now, I think, with a lot of activism. Um, and I think that I find a lot of people who are kind of coming into activism now have very set, set ideas about how things should work and would take issue with, with I think, a lot of um, the way that, um, transgender activists and queer theorists were kind of like talking about gender and sexuality back then, but I think that there's stuff there that is kind of potentially powerful if it's not misused. Um, it's so interesting. I feel like this is disrupting a tape in my head, which is always like, what are your, you know, what are your favorite books? What has influenced you? And I feel like there's a, there's a tape that I can sort of turn on and play, but this is a different question. And the thing that really bubbled up once I could interrupt that tape um, is, you know, not a work of fiction or a work that's primarily written, but a performance piece uh, that came through the Bay Area some time back. And it was um, Sarah Jones's piece, Women Can't, I think it was Women Can't Wait, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of this sort of collective international uh, voices of women. And it was it was this really, of, of all her work, she has a piece coming out now, I think it's coming to Berkeley Rep, about kind of sex work and sex trafficking. She and I may, I saw an earlier version of it, she and I may have some differences about kind of our perspectives, but um, this piece, which was commissioned, uh, was a, a solo piece about, it was like a rehearsal of women who were going to be testifying in front of the UN about places in the world where laws and customs were in an institutional way oppressing women and reinforcing or instigating violence against women. And you know, for people who don't know her, she's a solo performer, she played all the characters, she was flawless and brilliant, but it was just this, uh, it was so powerful to have this kind of healing moment of women coming together to take this opportunity to speak internationally and globally about you know, the war on women and violence against women. And I just, it stayed with me 
so, so strongly. So that was what I thought of. Also, and loving the salt eaters and that line that just will always echo, you know, are, are you sure? Because wholeness is a lot of work. And Tony K. Bombar was just an incredible and incredibly underappreciated writer. I think um, there's some new work that's just coming out about her. Mm. It's funny you mentioned that, that Sarah show. Um, that's a moment that changed my life. I got to open for her. That happened at Yerba Buena where I currently work. It's just funny. It was like 16, 17 years ago. But I remember that as a very defining moment in my artistry. So thank you for bringing that back to surface. Here's how the Q&A is going to work. You're going to raise your hand. And I'll be like, you. And then you're going to stand up. And then I'm going to repeat the question back to you, both so we can see if it's a question and also so that, um, so that the people on film can uh, get it on tape. So if you have a question, raise your hand right here in the blue. <laughs> Great question. Actually, your question was, can I answer some of my own questions? Especially speaking about your work that is coming out now. Sure. So I have a book that comes out um, in two weeks on City Lights Press called Dated MCs. It's a book of poems that superimposes my love life over my imaginations of what I think famous rap couples go through. Or also... <laughs> It's true, and also complicates um, form by putting very high art into very um, pop form, um, or vice versa. So it's kind of like lemonade in a text, like in a written text. <laughs> uh, I've written extensively on gentrification. Uh, what can we do to defeat Trump? Stop buying into the game. Stop. Like if he's on TV, turn off the TV. Yeah. If you know, if if CNN is running an extra twenty minutes of him after the debate, turn off the TV. Um, don't respond to it on Twitter. I think we're doing so much of his heavy lifting for him, keeping his name in the news cycles. All he wants, good or bad, he just wants to have his name repeated over and over. And I believe very seriously in the in the in the heft of spoken word and the in the weight and power of it. So, um, Voldemort, Voldemort. <laughs> I don't read Harry Potter either, but I know that much. Um, uh, other questions? I don't know. Uh, gentrification. I'm against it. <laughs> um, I'm pro-migration, and I'm interested in the way that Fabiana Rodriguez in particular complicates those notions um, as we make space for migrant communities um, and displace gentrification as an institution. I think they're two separate things that have to work together. Um, so safe, affordable healthy space for people coming into this country. That's what America's supposed to be about. Um, displacement and homes for the rich, however many homes they want, however many places they want them, is not what America's supposed to be about. So um, I'm off that. I'm off gentrification, but um, I am pro-life in the Bay Area. Let's go, Doves. Hand there. Yes. How do you avoid awareness burnout and not fall into pits of despair daily is my paraphrase. It's a question. I can start. Um, so my experience has been part of it is turn off the TV. Like we have a capacity for bad news and we have a capacity for bad news told by people who are telling it to us to sell things to us, right? One of the things, my source of news, I'm one of those people, my sources of news are Twitter and The Daily Show. And because... Mm, Trevor Noah, mm, sorry. Mm. I know, right? Mm. I mean, his um, intellect, guys. Yes. And dimples. Um, but part of it for me is I cannot look at those moving images of the news unless people are laughing at it. Because I cannot... I cannot actually process that sort of sterile news, like this is what Trump said today, like it's not a horrifying thing, you know? So I need to be laughing at it and I need it, um, and I need it coming from an empathic perspective. Some people maybe can do that and I can't. And I have a very, very limited amount of that that I can take in. And you know, I get, when I say I'm on Twitter, it means that people are telling me, go read this, go read that, and I'm reading things, but I'm reading them from actually empathic perspectives. The other thing that I have to say that's 
you know, real for me is therapy. And the and and I think part of the part of the way that um, those in power stay in power is that we live in a kind of oppressive society where everyone has early childhood experiences of some form that teach us you're powerless and shit is going to happen whether you like it or not. That's what life is. So we have those experiences on the individual level and then um, our political experiences reinforce that, but there's a way that we sigh and say, oh, well, I guess that's how it is based on the residue of those early emotional experiences. So for me, I've had to do a lot of personal healing to clean that up. And I loved what you said this morning about despair. What did you say? Despair is a leather jacket that everyone looks good in. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that was just like, I'm like, I'm going to tweet that, right? So I took it down. Um, but, but that's right. There's a way that... Um, despair is this shared experience because we live in the kind of oppressive ex in the kind of oppressive society where everyone experiences despair in childhood and so it's like our shared language and it's very powerful to go against that but i've found that like you know childhood is a space of terrorism in the united states like to be a child in a country like this that hates humans and children and women is to experience some form of terrorism so i think um, just working on our own stuff so that we can maintain hope and figuring out how to minimize the amount of toxins that we take in so that it's as much as we can transform. Don't take in more toxicity than you can creatively transform. I have a short, concrete answer. Stevie Wonder. <laughs> He gets me. Um, yeah, I, for one thing, I will also say that uh, I only like get my news through Twitter, basically, <laughs> um, which is good because a, um, while I have some like mainstream sources, so I can see what's kind of happening in the world. My Twitter feed is a lot of activists, so I can kind of see kind of empowering or challenging views on maybe whatever today's horrible news story is, um, and then also when 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 the despair gets especially high, I can just do my baseball filter and only look at baseball news. I'm into baseball. And so that's kind of like, <laughs> baseball's, I mean, you know, everyone has their own thing. You know, for you it could be crochet, for me it's baseball. And it's like this little world that's kind of, you know, it's in the real world and sometimes bad crap happens. You know, real life situations come on. But for the most part, it's just this like little world that's kind of separate and you can kind of go into it and then come out of, so that's nice. Um, and then, I would say also, actually, writing is a way that I a lot of times deal with it, because I, I feel like a lot of my nonfiction, I've, I've realized that a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, write something about this, like, horrible trans news story that just happened today, and I'm just like, ah, like, I'm really bad at reacting. Like, I can't be one of those people writing, like, reaction pieces all the time, um, both emotionally and also I just don't think I'm especially good at that. But I think what I am good at is kind of letting stuff sit with me for a while and slowly kind of processing it and maybe finding actually what I want to say about it or maybe a lot of times writing about it and just letting what comes out comes out. I find a lot of times that I start out writing a piece thinking I'm going in one direction and I end up thinking something completely different by the end because I've actually sat down and spent lots of time thinking about it as opposed to immediately like reacting to bad thing. I'm kind of mulling it over and, and kind of comparing it to other things. Um, and then also I would say, especially lately since I've been writing fiction, I've enjoyed that because that kind of like baseball is its own little world separate from the universe and where I'm kind of um, omniscient and omnipotent and I basically can decide like what is actually going to happen, so that can be <laughs> empowering too. You know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about hope and despair and how it works, and you know, it's funny, listening to people, I'm thinking it's almost like, you know, kind of like, it's almost like, God, I, there must be a less disgusting phrase than lifestyle choices. But, <laughs> but you know, I think, I think we, have, we get to make a lot of choices, and I think one is, you know, 
Emotions are contagious. De uh, being surrounded by depressing, despairing people, people who like to tear you down, people who like to tell you it's impossible, which is often an excuse for not trying. You know, it's really, because we always talk about emotions. It's like this sort of individual, American individualism, like you're sad, why should I be sad? And it's like you're around a whole community that's traumatized and it's kind of traumatic. But there's a lot of uh, people opt into despair a lot, privileged people, because it means they don't have to do a damn thing. If we can't win, we don't have to try. And one thing I found is we use this term activist to mean kind of like everybody who talks about activism, but it, actually it only applies to people who are actually doing something. And I find them very distinct from the people who are telling us why it's impossible to do it and why people, what was it, David Roberts, I quoted recently talking about the doing it wrong brigade. You know, the people who don't actually do anything but explain why you're doing it wrong and why you're not pure enough and perfect enough and uh, et cetera. And, uh, but the people who are actually fighting these things, whether it's civil rights or climate change or, you know, or health care or student debt or something like that, are just some of the most beautiful, remarkable, heroic people. And some of them are amazing. I look at some of these long-term struggles in recent history, and just understanding history for me is also really helpful. Like, have like the status of women gotten better in the last 20 minutes? I'm not so sure about that, but I know I was born into a world in which marital rape was not a concept, marital equality was not a concept, uh, domestic violence was not something anybody was interested in from a kind of legal and justice framework, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, discrimination, exclusion, segregation, you know, all those things, just like, you know, like around race. And I was, I'm, I'm so old, you don't have to be that old, though. That that to be, to be queer was to be considered mentally ill, criminal, or both. You know, like 40 years ago. So I think reading history is also really good to recognize that that kind of long arc of justice. That things change a lot. We are not in a static, stable world. And then to learn to make sure that you're not getting the mainstream version, which is that our blessed legislators who we should bow down to and, you know, when we get to choose every four years, make all the decisions. You know, we push them, we win. And Obama did not reject the Keystone Pipeline because suddenly he was, you know, you know he saw the light. He, saw, he rejected it because the climate movement pushed so hard that the cost of approving it was higher than the cost of, uh, you know, Crossing some of the most powerful oil industries in North America, so you know, so so it's like who you hang out with, what stories you t you tell yourself, because it's also, you know, from a kind of Zen perspective, there's a way people think like the loop tapes and their stories are just running, but we're running those tapes, and it's also about like being aware of what tapes you're running, what's feeding them, who's feeding them, and figure out like what what feeds your your sense of possibility, and it's also think about a kind of realism. You know, an uh, example I used recently, because I spent a lot of time in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, is like after the city was 80% flooded, all these people, some people in the city, the Cajun army from around the city, people from as far away as Texas, went into the city with their boats. Nobody went in there with their little boat thinking, I'm going to rescue everybody stranded on a rooftop. But they all thought, I can, get, I can get three people, I can get five people, I can get a family, I can get that mom with six kids in my boat and I can drop her off, them off and I can come back and get more. And so, you know, there's also a tendency to think in these super simplistic terms that if we don't win everything, we lose everything. And that sort of suggests like there's this finish line and it's like there is no finish line. We're going to do this work for the rest of our lives, which addresses the burnout thing. So, you, you know, there are moments where you have to push really hard and moments to pace yourself. But we do, you know, a lot of remarkable things have happened. And one of the books I love is Jonathan Schell's um, Unconquerable World, Power, Nonviolence, and the Will of the People, where he talks, as somebody who's done a lot about nuclear weapons, about the great counterpower that rose in the 20th century, which is nonviolent uh, direct action. And there is, you know, we have tremendous power, and that's not something you'll learn from the sort of black leather jacket despair leftists, and it's not something you're going to get from the mainstream media. And um, But it's something you can get from people like Howard Zinn, people like Cornell West, and um, people like Winona LaDuke. It's out there, and it's really just kind of figuring out, like, what, you know, how do you weed out despair? How do you feed hope? And anyway, I, I know that was really long. I spent a lot of time on it. So that's all of our time. <laughs>
one more time for Julia Serrano, Aya de Leon, and the incomparable Rebecca Solnit. <laughs>